Hello all, welcome to Narayana IAS Academy. This is Sureka Baskar presenting to you the daily news analysis. So for today's discussion, we've picked up a number of articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express, which are both important and relevant for the UPSC CSE examination. Now let us have a quick look at the topics one by one. The first article has been picked up from page number 13 of the Indian Express, India and the World in Modi 3.0. So this particular article provides us a glimpse into the the foreign policy approach as well as the priorities of the newly elected government in its third term across different regions and major countries across the globe. The second article has been picked up from page number one of the Hindu. Exports bounced 9% but the trade deficit hit 7-month peak in May 2024. So this particular article discusses about the trends and the developments in India's trade as well as trade deficit and the economic landscape of India. So here we'll be discussing about what has been the current status of the Indian economy specifically in terms of the exports, the imports, the trade deficit as well as the other associated associated aspects. The third article has been picked up from page number 11 of the Indian Express. The spice exports slipped 20% in May amid quality and safety concerns. So in this particular article, we'll be looking into the significant slip of the spice exports by up to 20% and also we'll be discussing about what significant contribution that the spice sector does to the Indian economy and what has been the current status of spice exports from India and what are all the associated safety concerns as well as the concerns which actually raise from pesticide contamination. The fourth article has been picked up from page number 10 of the Hindu. CIC, that is the Central Information Commission, upholds response to RTI query on presidential assent. So in this particular article, we'll be discussing about the Central Information Commission that has actually upheld the response to an RTI query regarding the presidential assent. The last article for the day has been picked up from page number 5 of the Indian Express. Launch of 2,800 crore digital agri mission which is set to be part of government's first 100-day agenda. So in this particular article, we'll be looking into what this particular digital agri mission which is worth of 2,800 crore is all about and which will be the first 100 days agenda of the newly elected government. Let us actually look at this particular scheme as well as its associated components. So we'll be concluding the session by practicing few of the prelims as well as the mains practice questions. Now let us start with the discussion. The first article for the day that we'll be discussing about is India and the world in Modi 3.0. So this particular article may actually appear to be political in nature. But here we'll be discussing about the broader perspective on what are the historical relations that we have actually shared with our immediate neighbours, our extended neighbours, etc. And we will look into what are all the different and the new geopolitical strategies as well as the foreign policy approach and priorities that will be taken up by the currently or the newly elected government in its third term in different parts of the world as well as different regions across the globe. So in this particular article is actually we'll be discussing about the international relations that India shares with its immediate neighbours as well as the shaping of foreign policy. And we can actually map this particular topic to GS Paper 2 for the mains examination under India and its neighbourhood relationship, effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interest. So moving forward, there has been a previous year question asked in the mains examination in the year 2013 on India-Sri Lanka relations. Okay, So with respect to that of international arena, all the you know immediate neighbours, the extended neighbours as well as the bilateral ties India shares with different countries like India-US, India-Russia, everything becomes important and any kind of geopolitical shift and its implication on India and India stand on conflicts like the Russian-Ukraine crisis, the you know Israel Palestine conflict all these are very very important for the examination so moving forward let us actually understand what this particular article is discussing about okay so the article provides a glimpse into the foreign policy approach as well as the priorities of the newly elected government in its third term across different regions as well as major countries of the world so moving forward, let us understand how many countries from our immediate neighbours and extended neighbourhood have been actually invited for the swearing-in ceremony of the newly elected government. So here, leaders of seven countries in India's neighbourhood, namely Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius as well as Seychelles, 
actually were attending the swearing in of the new government and also here you have to note that pakistan afghanistan and myanmar were actually not invited so here holistically we actually see that india must be focusing on or following the nimble diplomacy so what do you mean by nimble diplomacy india has to be very quick in adapting to any of the smallest geopolitical changes that is happening or occurring in any of its neighborhood okay be it china or nepal bhutan etc so what with at the same time we need to remember that without you know expecting them to actually reciprocate india has to be quick enough to adapt to any kind of policy changes or the government changes so here they are saying that india will need to be agile in its diplomacy in the neighborhood being unilaterally generous that is india has to be you know all the time able to be providing assistance to the neighborhood whenever they are, they are in case of emergencies be it the financial aid like how sri lanka expected in times of its financial crisis etc without insisting on reciprocity so moving forward now let us understand what is the kind of relationship or the areas of friction that india actually has with that of its neighborhood or the immediate neighbors the first neighbor is pakistan so first if you look at the historical engagement uh, from the past or since the independence engagement with pakistan has actually experienced some kind of fluctuations and frictions marked by there were initial efforts that have been made by the top diplomats in order to you know strike a dialogue but then often and regularly it is actually it has become a, a repetitive event that it is disrupted by the terrorist attacks as you know seen in the patan court as well as the uri incident that actually took place in 2016 the new government had actually came up in 2014 okay so since 2014 the government has actually been trying to strike dialogues as well as um, you know negotiations with that of pakistan but they have been constantly interrupted by terrorist attack example has been the patan court as well as the uri in 2016 and even recently while there was the swearing in ceremony that was actually taking place there was a terrorist attack in jammu and kashmir okay so here if you look at the current situation with Sharif that is the new prime minister actually coming back to power and sending peace messages India actually remains very very cautious prioritizing India's security and countering any kind of terrorism and also if you see what is India's stance towards Pakistan in the recent days is that it actually says that consistent policy of terror and talks cannot go together okay so India has actually been focusing on preventing its security as well as sovereignty by saying that terror as well as talks or negotiations cannot take place at the same time and this has actually been spoken in lieu of the recent terror attack that has actually taken place on the day of the swearing in ceremony now moving on to our next neighbor afghanistan here what is the kind of diplomatic relations that we share is that there has been no formal diplomatic ties since taliban actually took over the government or the rule in 2021 where the us had actually evacuated or left afghanistan and here the engagement you cannot see any kind of top level engagements that are actually happening so india is providing only you know some aid in terms of humanitarian assistance through a technical team avoiding any kind of high level engagement next if you move to myanmar we know that the military junta has actually overthrown the current government however india is actually involved or it has been engaged with the military junta amidst the internal armed resistance that is actually taking place and also we need to know that india is also ready to extend hands with the opposition in case this particular junta actually topples any time next one is maldives there has been a political shift because you know the recently elected um, president that is mohammed moitso he is actually you know found to be inclined or influenced by the chinese policy and also campaigned on the india out platform but however he has actually visited here and this can actually be seen in the light of the lakshadweep row where our prime minister has actually promoted lakshadweep instead of maldives in this particular row okay so here Mohammed Muitsu who campaigned on an India out platform had actually visited India indicating a readiness in order to engage the post adjustments in the military personnel and also here you have aimed to stabilize and strengthen relations despite the initial anti india sentiments is actually going on between India and Maldives now moving to Bangladesh what happens is that first is the rhetoric impact due to some incursion of the Bangladeshi specifically in the northeastern states of Assam 
what happened they were actually termed as infiltrators by the indian politicians as well as the media and this has actually you know ignited some kind of uh, friction between both the sides and also there has to be emphasis on mutual interest in countering extremism and terrorism with expected restraint in the political rhetoric next one is the bhutan first one is support continuity india has actually been giving and you know helping and to bhutan since the inception of its um, you know five year plan in the year 1961 and also has been given you know financial stimulus you know for the development of infrastructure etc as well as the gelafo mindfulness city project okay and next if you look at the geopolitical context it actually aims to counter china's attempts in order to negotiate the border independently ensuring bhutan's alignment with india and also here you need to know about the doklam issue or the standoff where the chinese incursion was actually there in this tri junction area which was a tri junction between india bhutan as well as china where chinese army had actually incurred over there there was incursion in order to develop or expand the infrastructural projects but india through operation juniper had actually curbed the same thereby providing aid or in order to secure the security of bhutan india had actually given an helping hand okay so that is this doklam standoff next one coming to our next neighbor that is nepal there has been the diplomatic challenge because post 2015 there had actually been an economic blockade that was uh, levied by india on nepal because of the influence of chinese policies in nepal okay so here it countered china's strong political influence and now you know it is a need to address nepal's use of beijing card against new delhi and restore goodwill Next one is Sri Lanka. So India has always been extending financial support, even in terms of the recent financial crisis that Sri Lanka had actually faced with financial assistance as well as investment. And also there is political sensitivity which is actually hovering around the Kachatibu issue, where both the sides, that is both Sri Lanka and um, India, especially. the state of tamil nadu they actually claim the sovereignty that is india claims that they have sovereignty over kachatibu and vice versa next moving on to seychelles as well as mauritius if you look at the maritime diplomacy upgrading port infrastructure as part of maritime diplomacy actually has been the key and next one there is success in agalaga islands in mauritius as well as ongoing challenges with assumption islands which is actually located in seychelles now apart from the immediate neighbors if we look at the bilateral ties india has with actually other countries first one includes india and united states where the strategic relations has been there that is bipartisan support for strong strategic ties focusing specifically on defense as well as technology however india actually faces challenges because you know the uh, us or the western media and the government always criticize the democratic government established by india as well as you know the freedom to press that is actually given and uh, the fundamental rights are always been questioned okay Moving on next one is Europe the economic and the political ties here there has been strengthened ties with France and Germany and keen on conducting the free trade agreements with the UK and the EU is actually been the focus of late and also addressing issues like the assassination plot against the Khalistani uh you know leaders or the terrorists are actually going on over here with respect to that of Europe and this is also true in uh, terms of Canada okay and here if you see canada there has been a political strain here political ties are actually strained due to kind of accusations and assassinations that are happening in the khalistani separatist murder case and also if you see the economic stability it is important in order to maintain economic ties and the student flows despite the political tensions that actually get in place with both the countries now moving on the challenge of china always we actually have been having the border standoff with that of china especially in the line of actual controlled region in the north so here we have to address the ongoing border standoff seeking complete disengagement as well as deescalation of any kind of conflict which is going on there as well as high level engagements actually have to be there between both the sides in terms of negotiations so here utilize high level meetings such as the modi's meeting with xi jinping for potential resolution of the same moving forward in case of russia if you see there is defense and energy dependency that india has ha- india actually has been having because india import sufficient amount of cheaper oil from russia and also in the t- in terms of ukraine conflict india has actually not shown complete resistance against what russia has actually done so advocate for 
dialogue and diplomacy emphasizing the need for Russia and Ukraine to engage in peace talks without harming India's interests. And now in terms of West Asia, if you see, there is actually a necessity for building strong ties where continuing building strong ties with the countries like Saudi Arabia, Israel, UAE, Iran, Qatar and Egypt are very, very important given that there is a lot of conflict going on between Israel as well as Palestine. And here there are also a number of strategic initiatives that have been taken place like promoting initiatives like the IMEC, which is nothing but connecting India via Middle East to Europe. So IMEC Economic Corridor, as well as we have the International North-South Transit Corridor, which aims to connect Russia with that of the Indian Ocean via Iran, that is it connects the Caspian Sea, etc. So here amidst uncertainties like the Israel-Hamas conflict, all these are believed to be the top priorities of the newly elected government. The next article that we'll be discussing about is exports bounced 9% but trade deficit has actually hit 7-month peak in the month of May 2024. So in this particular article, as a broader perspective, we'll be discussing about the recent trends and the development in the Indian economic landscape, specifically with respect to what is the current status of exports, imports, the trade deficit, the capital account deficit as well as sector-specific growth. So this particular article deals with trade deficit and this is a part of economic growth and development and we can map this particular topic to economy under the prelims examination and for the mains examination it can be mapped to GS paper 3 economic growth and development. So moving forward there has been a previous year question that has been asked in the year 2017 in the mains examination with respect to that of failure of the manufacturing sector in achieving the goal of labor intensive exports. So here you know that the situation or the current trends of exports, imports, why it has actually declined and what impact does it have on the Indian economy, all this is very, very important. So moving forward, let us understand what this particular article is discussing about, okay? So India's merchandise trade deficit has actually widened to a seven-month high of about 23.7 billion in the month of May 2024, according to the data that has been recently released by the Ministry of Commerce. So what do you mean by trade deficit is it is nothing but when a country's overall imports actually exceeds that of exports, okay? So moving forward, let us understand what has been the key highlights of the data that has been released by the ministry. So first one is India's merchandise trade deficit. This has actually widened to a seven-month high to of about 23.78 billion in May due to rising imports, particularly what are the imports that have increased? It is petroleum, vegetable oil, as well as transportation equipment. Next one, the merchandise exports actually grew, however, by 9.13% to around 38.13 billion, while the imports rose 7.7% to around 61.91 billion, okay? Moving forward, the petroleum products which account for nearly 32% of India's imports had actually increased by 28% to around 19.95. So here, these uh, statistics and the data are not important. It is important, however, to know the trends on how it is actually happening and the impact it actually has and what are the agents that actually cause. Okay, next one. If you see, apart from petroleum, Imports of transportation equipment that has been 31.88, silver, vegetable oil and pulses also actually drove the import growth. And as you see, the export growth was actually driven by demand for petroleum products, the engineering goods, electronic goods as well as textiles from India. Then if you see the widening trade deficit, that is when a country's import is actually exceeding that of the exports, this is actually expected to increase the current account deficit to around 1.5% of the GDP in the second quarter from 1.1% in the first quarter. So now it is important for us to understand what is this concept of trade deficit as well as current account deficit. Before that, let us actually see how has been the trend of services exports. This also grew around 11.7% to 30.16 billion while the imports actually increased 8.8 .8 to around 17 billion and this actually resulting in a surplus of around 12.88 billion. Now let us see what is this concept of trade deficit as well as the current account deficit. Trade deficit is nothing but it refers the difference between a country's imports and the exports of goods that is the merchandise trade and when the imports exceed the exports, it is actually resulting in the trade deficit. 
Now, if you look at what is this current account deficit, it is actually a broader measure that includes not only the trade balance, that is, it does not only refer to what is the export and the amount of import and how it is balanced, but also the net factor income in terms of any kind of remittances, in kind of interest, as well as dividends is earned and the net transfer payments, okay? And also, a current account deficit actually occurs when the country's total imports of goods, services and transfers actually are said to be greater when compared to that of the total exports that the country actually does. Now, moving forward, let us actually look at the critical analysis of what is happening in the Indian economy. First one is there is a rising trade deficit which we saw. This actually indicates that a growing imbalance is happening between exports and imports and this can actually put immense pressure on the country's forex reserve as well as currency valuation. Okay, The value of your currency might actually decrease. Next one is high trade deficit actually means that more foreign currency is flowing out of the country in order to pay for the imports because we pay for the imports in dollars, right? Than is coming in through the exports which can actually deplete the foreign exchange reserves that we actually have. And also a large trade deficit indicates a relatively weaker demand for the country's currency in the global market. That is demand for rupee is actually less as it needs to buy more foreign currency in order to pay for the imports which can lead to depreciation or devaluation of the domestic currency. Okay. Moving forward, the next analysis is import dependency. There is actually observed that there is a high dependency on the imports and this highlights the need for greater self-reliance, particularly in sectors like energy as well as agriculture. Now moving on to see how has been the export performance. While exports actually grew by 9.13%, the growth rate is actually relatively very, very modest and there is no significant increase. Okay, And especially... When excluding petroleum and gems and jewellery, if you actually see, there has not been a significant increase. And this actually suggests that there has to be diversification of the export basket that India actually has in order to increase the competitiveness Okay, in other sectors through measures like improving the infrastructure, reducing the logistic cost as well as promoting the value added manufacturing. And if you see, according to the Economic Survey 2022-2023, India's logistic costs are between 14-18% to 18 of its GDP, which is actually higher than the global benchmark of around 8%. Now moving on, what is the impact on the current account deficit? Let us see. The widening trade deficit is expected to increase India's current account deficit that we actually saw what it was to 1.5% of GDP in the second quarter when compared to that of 1.1 in the previous quarter. And this can actually make the economy more vulnerable to any kind of external shocks as well as outflow of the capital. Okay. Next, moving on, the services exports. India's services exports, we actually saw they continued to perform well, registering 11.7% and this was actually doing good. And if you see global economic conditions, there are geopolitical tensions because, you know, there's a lot of crisis which is going on, the Hamas conflict in the Red Sea. So all this is actually hampering the trade as well as there's been a supply side constraint over here. And supply chain disruptions have been there. This can further impact the trade flows as well as further exacerbate the condition of or the current prevailing excess, uh, you know, trade deficit that, uh, you know, is there can be affected by the geopolitical shocks that has actually been happening. The next article that we'll be discussing about is spice exports slip 20% in May amid safety as well as quality concerns. So in this particular article, we'll be looking into what is the contribution of the spice sector to India and what has been the recent challenges with respect to that of pesticide contamination as well as the safety safeguards. Okay, so let us actually look into it. So here we'll be discussing about the spice industry in India with respect to that of its exports as well as spices board of India. So this particular topic can actually be mapped to the economy under prelims examination under current events of national and international importance. So moving forward, let us actually look at the previous year question that has been asked in the year 2022 in the preliminary examination with reference to that of T board in India, consider the following statement. So these kind of, uh, you know, any kind of statutory as well as constitutional bodies are very, very important for your exam, be it polity, economy or any other related subject. 
Now moving forward, let us understand what this particular article is discussing about. So after registering consecutive rise in the exports of around 51% and 12% in the previous years, now it is very concerning that the spice export has actually reduced or slipped by 20%. So let us see here. So after registering a 51% and 12% year-on-year jump in the spice exports in March as well as April respectively, the spice exports had actually slipped by 20.28% in May to around $361.17 million. Now moving forward, let us actually understand what it is about. What is the reason for the slip in the exports? So the main reason for decline in India's spice exports in May 2024 were the concerns over safety as well as a detection of higher than permissible levels of ethylene oxide. Okay, so this ethylene oxide, which is actually, you know, the formula is C2H4O. This is actually used as a disinfectant or a sterilizing agent or it is used for the process of fumigation that is in order to kill the bacteria and the other agents. Okay, so here let us see. In some spice products, there was higher than permissible levels of ethylene oxide which were found. And here in the product shipments from major Indian brands like the Everest as well as MDH, in or, I mean, which were actually exported to markets of Hong Kong as well as Singapore. The main concern is that ethylene oxide is being used excessively as well as improperly as a sterilizing agent leading to the presence of toxic and carcinogenic residues in the final spice product that has been exported. And since then what happened was the Spice Board of India has begun mandatory testing of the Indian spice shipments to Singapore as well as Hong Kong. Okay. Now moving forward, let us actually understand the basics of what is this ethylene oxide all about. Okay, It is a colorless gas with a faint sweet odor. That is the smell. It is highly reactive as well as flammable. That is it can actually catch fire quickly. The characteristics include the chemical formula is C2H4O that you can actually see over here. The boiling point is 10.7 degrees Celsius or 51.3 degree Fahrenheit. It is soluble in water, alcohol and most other organic solvents. If you actually look at the applications of this particular ethylene oxide, it is used as a sterilizing agent for the medical equipment as well as the spices. And here it is employed in the production of ethylene glycol and as well as other chemicals and also used in fumigation of certain agriculture products. Okay, So fumigation is also a kind of disinfection. So moving forward, what are the effects is that it can actually cause irritation to the human organs like eyes, skin as well as respiratory tract and long term exposure is actually linked to cancer, reproductive efforts as well as a neurotoxicity and this has actually been classified as human carcinogen by the International Agency of Research on Cancer that is the IARC. Moving forward, let us now understand quickly about the Spices Board of India. So here it is a statutory body which has been constituted under the Spices Board Act of 1986 by merging the erstwhile cardamom board as well as the Spices Export Promotion Council. And if you look at the parent authority, it is Department of Commerce which is functioning under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Here, the, what is a commodity board here? The Spices Board is actually one among the five commodity boards functioning under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. The other four apart from Spice Board include one is the Coffee Board, which is a statutory body under the Coffee Act of 1942. The Rubber Board, a statutory body again under the Rubber Act of 1947. Tea Board, a statutory body under the Tea Act of 1953. As well as Tobacco Board, a statutory body under the Tobacco Board Act of 1975. And here, if you see the responsibility of this particular spice board is it is responsible for the overall development of the cardamom industry as well as promotion of export of around 52 spices which have been listed in the schedule of the Spice Board Act of 1986. So moving forward, what are all the list of the spices which are mentioned in the schedule of the Spice uh, Board Act of 1986? Some of them actually include cardamom, fenugreek, then aniseed, ajwan, then curry leaf, mint, mustard, vanilla, teach, pepper long, star anise, sweet flag, then cambodge, then juniper berry, etc. So this list is however not very important, but however it's just for a general knowledge purpose, it is uh, you know sufficient that if you just read through this one. The next article that we'll be discussing about is CIC that is the Central Information Commission upholds the response to RTI that is the right to information query on presidential assent. 
So in this particular article, we'll be discussing about this institution of Central Information Commission and the powers. As well as this actually can be mapped to GS Paper 2 and also for the prelims examination, it comes under important statutory bodies. So moving forward, there has actually been a PYQ in the year 2014. UPSC has asked the question on which of the following is not a constitutional body. So all kinds of constitutional, statutory and quasi-judicial body as well as offices which are actually held are very, very important for your preliminary examination. So moving forward, let us understand what this particular article is discussing about. So recently, the Central Information Commission had actually upheld the response that has been provided by the Rashtrapati Bhavan to an RTI query that was actually raised regarding the former President Ramnath Govind's decision on returning the proposals from the Prime Minister or the Union Council of Ministers. That is nothing but, see, the President actually acts on, you know, the aid and advice of the Prime Minister and the Union Council of Ministers. So, here the petitioner had actually filed under the RTI Act in order to know how many times the President had actually sent back or returned the proposals that had been given by the Prime Minister or the Council of Ministers, okay. So, here let us understand what is actually, you know, the what the query is all about and what was uh, the grounds on which the CIC actually upheld this. So, the query was how many times did the former President Coven return a decision that had been taken by the Prime Minister or the Union Council of Minister for consideration or reconsideration. So, here... The response that was given by the Rashtrapati Bhavan was that no data was actually available. So now what happened? The petitioner actually argued for transparency and accountability of the same, emphasizing the importance of disclosing the information or regarding the president's legislative actions. So here the CIC actually ruled that it upheld that the Rashtrapati Bhavan's response by saying that the information can only be shared if it is actually held and available in the records as per the RTI Act 2005. So, you know, times of non-availability of data, the person is actually not mandated to provide any kind of answer. Okay. So, now let us understand quickly about this particular Central Information Commission. Here it is important to understand it is a statutory body established under the RTI Act of 2005. It functions as an overseer for implementing the RTI Act in organizations of the central government as well as the union territories. And jurisdiction is very important. It extends to all the public offices under the central government and the UTs and headquarters is actually in New Delhi. Now, let us look into the powers and functions. It actually exercises the powers that are conferred on them under the RTI Act. And here, its basic function is to receive and inquire into the complaints from any citizen under Section 18 of the RTI Act of 2005. Next one is to receive and decide upon the second appeal from any citizen under Section 19 of the RTI Act. Next is to perform the duty of monitoring and reporting under Section 25 of the RTI Act. And it shall provide access to all the public records that is during enquiry. CIC can ask for the records under the control of a public authority. And also the so motor power is there. That is it can order an enquiry into any matter with reasonable grounds. That is a so motor power. And while enquiring the CIC has the powers of a civil court. This is very very important with respect to that of its summoning as well as requiring documents etc. The next one is it secures the compliance that is CIC has the power to secure the compliance with its decisions from public authority. And also if you see the annual reports, CIC submit the annual report to the central government and the central government is supposed to place this record or the report before the parliament. Now moving forward, it is important to understand the composition, basically the composition, appointment, eligibility criteria, all these are important. Okay, So CIC as an institution comprises of a chief information commissioner and not more than 10 information commissioners. Here the appointment of them is actually done by the president on the recommendation of a committee that consists of number one, prime minister is actually the chairperson. There is leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha and a union cabinet minister who is nominated by the Prime Minister. Here the eligibility is the members of the CIC and the SIC that is the State Information Commission shall be persons of eminence in public life with wide knowledge and experience in law 
in science and technology, social service management, journalism, mass media or administration and governance. What who are all excluded here is that the members shall actually not be an MP that is member of parliament or member of legislative assembly of any state or union territory as the case may be or he or she cannot hold any other office of profit or concerned with any political party or carry on any business or pursue any kind of other profession. Okay. So moving on, let us look at the tenure. The members shall hold office for such term as prescribed by the central government or until they attain the age of 65 years, whichever is earlier. If you see reappointment, this is very, very important as it, it can be asked as one of your statements in the MCQ in your prelims examination. So CIC is not eligible for reappointment, but each IC that is information commissioner shall on vacating his office is eligible for appointment as the CIC itself. Further, his or her term of office shall not be more than five years in aggregate as the information commissioner and the CIC. If you see the salary, here the salary, the allowances and other service conditions of the members shall be as prescribed by the central government under the RTI Amendment Act of 2019. And here, the, let's look into the removal process. The president is actually the sole person who can remove the members of the CIC under the following circumstances. It can be if the member is adjudged as an insolvent or if the central government holds him responsible for an offence involving moral turpitude or if he is convicted of such an offence. Next, if he engages during his term in any paid employment outside the duties of his office. And the next one, if he is declared unfit by reason of infirmity of mind or body by the president. Next one, the president can also remove the members on the ground of proven misbehaviour or any kind of incapacity. But for that, he has to refer the matter to the Supreme Court for an inquiry. And after this inquiry, the Supreme Court upheld the cause of the removal then the president can actually remove him. And moving on, during the inquiry by the Supreme Court, the president may suspend the member from holding that particular office. The next article that we'll be discussing about is launch of Rs 2,800 crore digital agri mission part of government's agenda for the first 100 days. So in this particular article, we'll be discussing about what is this proposed project or the mission of digital agri mission, which is going to be part of the government's agenda for the initial three months period of time. So here we'll be discussing about what is this digital agriculture mission and this is a part of the role of technology in agriculture. And also, we can map this particular topic to economy under prelims examination and for the mains examination, it can be mapped to GS paper 3 e technology in the aid of farmers as well as agriculture. So, moving forward, if we actually look at the previous year question, there has been a question which has been asked in the prelims examination in the year 2018 on the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. So, any topic related to agriculture and the schemes associated with that, the beneficiaries, the outcomes and India's performance so far and different states how they have performed, all these are important for your preliminary examination. So, moving forward, let us actually discuss about what this particular news article is talking about. So the central government is actually set to launch a Rs 2,800 crore digital agriculture mission as a part of its first 100-day agenda which is aimed at transforming the rural as well as the agriculture sectors in India. So, moving forward, let us understand this digital agriculture mission. So, the initial launch plan was that the mission was initially planned to be launched in the period of around 2021 and 2022 but this was unfortunately delayed due to the COVID-19 outbreak. And the budget of this year, it includes the budgetary allocation of around 2,800 crores and the implementation period is actually rolled over for the next two years till 2025-2026. Now, let us look into the different components of this particular mission. The first one is that it will actually have a nationwide farmer's registry where it actually includes a unique farmer ID where every farmer will be assigned a unique ID. And also followed by that, there is PM Kisan and Fasal Bima Yojana. Here, the farmers will be able to avail themselves of these particular schemes through their unique IDs. Okay, so these are insurances. Next one, the financial services they actually include. The unique farmer ID will facilitate access to the farm loans and the insurance among other financial services. And also, the pilot projects have been initiated in six districts, namely 
the Farukhabad in Uttar Pradesh and also Bead in Maharashtra and also Gandhi Nagar in Gujarat as well as Fatehgarh Sahib in Punjab and Virudhnagar in Tamil Nadu. And following this, there is another component that is the crop zone registry. Here, the records of the crops, that is, this particular registry will document the crop zone by each farmer on their land, aiding in better planning as well as crop production estimation. Moving forward, this, you know, what is the significance of this particular registry is that it will enable precise planning and the estimation of the production of crops. So, this will, you know, in hand actually improve the agriculture productivity as well as further allocation of resources and how much of inputs are actually required. All this can be mapped. Next one is geo-referencing of village maps. What is this? Geo-referencing is nothing but it is a process of aligning the spatial data such as the map of a particular village with the geographic coordinates thereby enabling accurate mapping and analysis of specific locations. So here it will help in creating precise and detailed village maps for improved agricultural planning. Now let us solve few prelims as well as the mains practice question. The first question reads, the term geo-referencing sometimes mentioned in news refers to, it is the technique of relating digital map coordinates to the geography coordinates on the earth. So since C is the correct answer, the correct answer will be option C. So moving forward, a very high trade deficit actually impacts the value of a country's currency in which of the following ways? It appreciates the currency. No, this is actually wrong. It depreciates the currency. Yes, it is correct. It has no effect on the currency value. This is wrong. It stabilizes the currency. This is also wrong. So since B is the correct option, the answer will be option B. So moving on, the third question reads, with reference to ethylene oxide, consider the following statements. It is a colorless gas soluble in both water and alcohol. Yes, this is correct. It is classified as human carcinogen by the IARC. This is also correct. Since both the statements are correct, the answer will be option C. So moving forward, the fourth question, with reference to that of the Spices Board of India, consider the following statements. So Spices Board is a statutory body. Yes, this is correct. It is a regulatory body attached to the Ministry of Agriculture. No, this is wrong. It is under Ministry of Commerce. And then rosemary as well as oregano are among the spices for which the Spices Board is responsible for overall development. Yes, this is actually correct. Since the statements 1 and 3 are correct, the correct answer will be option C. The fifth question with reference to that of the Chief Information Commission, consider the following statements. It is a constitutional body in India. No, this is actually wrong. Its jurisdiction extends to all the public offices under the central government, the UTs and the state. This is also wrong. It looks into the complaints made to it and decides the appeals regarding matters related to the RTI Act and pertaining to the public offices. This is actually correct since only statement 3 is correct. The correct answer is option C. Now moving on to the mains practice question. The question reads, discuss the outline for India's foreign policy approach and the priorities in its neighbourhood. So here the approach answer is actually divided into three, the introduction, the body and the conclusion. So in the introduction, we will introduce the regional focus of India's foreign policy under the new government, emphasising proactive and strategic regional engagement. In the body, we will be talking about India's diplomatic strategies towards the neighbouring countries, focusing on non-reciprocal generosity. This is what we call it as the nimble diplomacy, Okay, that India has to be agile, etc., also, we will be discussing about the country-specific policies for Pakistan, Afghanistan, Maldives, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, etc. Highlighting the blend of security, economic as well as political considerations. And also note the exclusion of certain countries from the diplomatic events reflecting specific challenges. That is, Pakistan was not invited, Myanmar was not invited, Afghanistan was not invited because... You know, Taliban actually took over it in 2021. So all these things. And in conclusion, we need to summarize the significance of these approaches in enhancing India's regional influence and security, aligning with broader strategic objectives. So with this, we have actually come to the conclusion of our daily news analysis. So for regular updates, please do like, share and subscribe to Narayana IA's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.